We are a little bit delayed, but that doesn't matter. We will extend the session at the end if we have a good discussion. So, welcome to uh, the session, a dual plenary session uh, entitled uh, Electricity Finance and Electricity Market Design. Uh, we know that uh, in Europe and in many other countries there is a lack of investments. The exception is renewable industry. Is a renewable energy. That means if there is no support scheme for renewable energy, there is everywhere a little bit lacking of investments. And at the same time, we are still working on liberalizing our electricity market in Europe, the, uh, developing the single European market. The regulator is very active to change the rules of the market, to modify the rules so that these markets work smoothly. We have the discussion whether we need, in addition to the energy or energy only market, whether we need the capacity market. And finally, the European Commission has invited uh, the member states to change from the fit fact, uh, for reward, the support of renewable energy uh, fixed uh, uh, fit in tariff system to a polar system and uh, in the, the, the option system. So that means the support of renewable energy may change very significantly. And all this has, of course, consequences on how to finance energy investments. And I hope we will be able to clarify a little bit the relations between the regulation, both in the field of energy market as well as in the field of renewable energy um, and uh, finance. And for this, I think we have uh, a very distinguished speaker. Uh, our first speaker will be Professor Lars Bergmann. He is from the Stockholm School of Economics in Sweden and he was uh, some years ago <coughs> president of the IEE. Uh, second speaker will be Christoph Bonnery. He is director from uh, our uh, no, no, Platinum sponsor ERDF, that is the, the French Grid, Electricity Grid Society. And, um, he is the president of the French affiliate of the IAE. And last but not least, we have Miss Sylvia Kreibiel. She is from the Frankfurt School of Finance in Germany and works for the United Nations Environment Program Collaborating Center for Climate and Sustainable Energy. And this Frankfurt School of Energy produces an annual report about financing energy investment. So she brings the perspective of the finance industry in our world. So uh, let us start with the discussion. And our first speaker is Professor Lars Bergmann. Yeah. 
as being vertical separation of the, of the power industry between generation, transmission, distribution, and retailing, and introduce third party access to the transmission networks and opening up a competition in, in generation and retailing. And by now, uh, some kind of liberalized electricity market is uh, in all member states in the EU. And uh, there's an increase in and by now quite significant trade in electricity across national borders. However, there is still a long way to go to what is called a single European market for electricity. Now, what were the expectations at the time of the introduction of the reform? Well, I think it was very important to remember that one of the important expectations was that our industry investments should be driven by regular market forces. And that would be a way to reduce overcapacity <coughs> and in the end to increase productivity in, in, in the energy industry. But as Jörg mentioned, and we all know in recent years, uh, very significant subsidy schemes have been introduced in order to support green electricity, such as wind, solar and so on. And uh, these investments have been driven by subsidies and actually uh, led to something very different than investment climate in which market, regular market forces all the problems. Uh, another important expectation was that uh, energy-only markets would uh, generate sufficient revenues to finance power industry investments and also to induce uh, power industry investments. Uh, the beauty of energy-only markets is that they are very simple, transparent and easy to understand. So, uh, like in the Nordic countries, where it has actually worked very well, uh, there is uh, basically one, one single open uh, energy-only market, and then on top of us, the GSO, who is taking care of the 5G. So, uh, these were the results, but um, uh, as you know, um, there are increasing concerns that uh, the energy of the markets will not be able to provide the revenues that are necessary to finance and induce investments without subsidies. So, what has happened? Well, um, there's much more energy and not so much capacity. That's the short summary. The subsidy schemes have actually led to a very significant reduction of intermittent power, such as wind, solar, and so on. And that has increased the supply of electricity, which, as you know, has a depressing impact on prices. However, the addition to peak load capacity has not been as significant. Actually, the expected production in the wind power plant is very low at a certain hour. And at least in the northern part of Sweden or in Europe, we know that uh, the days when it's very cold, it doesn't blow at all. So there is a problem with capacity, and uh, which means that uh, power systems, uh, although we think all the sun has been becoming more and more uh, uh, dependent on, on uh, renewable resources, we still need to have uh, conventional power to provide the, the necessary peak capacity. And being in need of needing to have the power. The conventional power means that the profitability of conventional power remains very important. So, what happens with prices and revenues in this new environment? Well, uh, one very important feature of wind and solar is that uh, the marginal cost when there is wind and sun is actually zero, or very, very close to zero. So, uh, they will outcompete the conventional power plants easily, which means that the number of hours in operation which plants will be reduced, and if nothing else happens, as if there is volumes, that will reduce the, the revenues of the, of the conventional power plants. On the other hand, uh, the conventional power plants will produce at, during periods when there is no or very little uh, intermittent power, which means the prices are likely to be higher than. So the net effect on, on the revenues depends on the um, the number of how much intermittent power we have, and thus how many hours of operation there will be in commercial power, and on the other hand also the 
prices during years of low women so the power out. Um, however, in most countries, or in all countries I know about, there are, there are caps on electricity prices. So that, uh, that, uh, that the fewer hours of operation will not necessarily be fully compensated by periodic and the result is that it's very likely that with a lot of intermittent power in the system, uh, revenues will be reduced. And as a result, the probability that peak capacity will be insufficient increases. And this is really the missing model problem, where how can you get the incentives to and the finance to, to build uh, peak capacity, to maintain peak capacity in an environment where market prices are already low, and, and, uh, uh, but still, we need a lot of dispatchable power. Uh, so, how can you solve this reasonable problem? Well, uh, there is a round of rush towards capacity markets now, and I think it's good at least for an economist to think for a second about uh, what we would call the first best solution to possible. <coughs> and so, that would be. That may seem to be to abolish the price caps so that peak capacity units can earn a lot of money during short periods. However, there is a very unique feature of electricity markets, and that is that customers in general do not observe and do not react on prices in real time. The result is that the short run price elasticity is very low, and that market clean prices, if they even exist, tend to be very high and sometimes for much higher than, than uh, the willingness to pay for interest. So the first best solution does not seem to be feasible. However, in the future with more technology, more advanced technology, it might be possible to uh, for customers to actually observe and react on, on prices in real time. And uh, then much of this missing on the problem might disappear. Uh, it also has a special issue about uh, price volatility, which I'll come back to later. So, uh, I, I think it's good to remember that it might be a first best solution, but although it doesn't seem the best feasible right now. So, what are the alternatives? Well, the second best solution is to have a market for capacity, some kind of capacity mechanism to be anything at all. So, that will be trade in megawatt hours and in megawatts. Uh, capacity markets exist. Well, first of all, um, TSOs have a kind of capacity market, but it's usually very small, and that is what we are, we are talking about here. Now we are talking about capacity markets, which will really play a significant role in the market. And they do exist. Uh, there is a very good article in a fairly recent uh, issue of the EAP. Uh, summarizing the experiences in the US from various kinds of uh, or from the existing capacity markets. And uh, the conclusion is that uh, these markets seem to work, i.e., to solve this money problem in a relatively good way. However, there are many uh, other aspects that are being discussed, but uh, it is seem to be working. Uh, <coughs> Capacity markets can be designed in many different ways, but there is one common feature. Uh, they include the regulation on the minimum available peak capacity. So there is one more very significant regulation that is added to the power industry, and which will, of course, have an enormous impact on investments. So again, um, we have taken another step away from the vision about uh, the industry in which investments are created. In theory, uh, this minimum peak capacity could be determined on the basis of this benefit analysis. Uh, what is the valuation on the margin of uh, security of supply and the cost of providing peak, peak capacity and so on? Um, I haven't seen an example of that uh, in practice, but rather uh, technical standards and perhaps slightly political ideas are also playing a role in determining how much minimum capacity we need. And that is the real driver then of the capacity market. Um, 
Um, there are many issues related to capacity markets. Uh, one is uh, what I already touched on, the user side uh, has to be equal. Uh, because if you only have the producer side, it is very likely that, that uh, the cost of maintaining security supply will be pretty high. And in a country such as Sweden, uh, we have a large number of households with electric heating, and switching off electric heating for a number of two doesn't matter. So there is an enormous risk resource in low cost reductions of, of the capacity demand and somehow one needs to find ways of cooperating the market. Um, also if every country goes their own way, I think that the realization of the single European market will be a lot more complicated. There is another aspect of intermittent power which I'll touch upon in my last three minutes here. And that is that uh, you could have more stochastic factors on the supply side and that would probably add to price volatility. Uh, however, price volatility has been around in the electricity market all the time and uh, so it's very important to find ways of hedging uh, these price risks. And this is where the financial markets come in. It would be very costly for producers and consumers to be directly exposed to volatile prices. And the role of financial markets is exactly to provide insurance for that. And a uh, key factor here is the design of the, of the uh, financial instruments. And then I'll take just one example in the world countries and also show that the connection between the electricity market and the financial regulation. So in Sweden, or the Nordic uh, area, um, which is quite a big electricity market, around 40 kilowatt per year. Nord Pool, or the Nord Pool spot, is uh, the common spot market, where more than 80% of the electricity produced is sold. Uh, there is uh, a lot of trade with financial contracts at the Nasdaq Nordmex, and about 95% of all the power trading is being reported and cleared with the Nasdaq Nordmex clearing. And, uh, the market consists of fundamental members, that is, uh, producer basic and consumers of electricity, but also financial institutions of basic. Bank guarantees are very important here because um, they have an instrument here called the DS Future Contract, where uh, a not fully backed bank guarantee works as a collateral. So the, the Power companies do not have to put up a lot of financial assets to fully back these guarantees. And this is a key reason for the success and the high liquidity of the of the uh, market. And that has reduced the cost of hedging the price risks. Now, uh, following on the bank crisis, there are lots of new financial regulations coming, and one of them is what implies that uh, it will not and it will be possible to have these uh, not fully back guarantees. And uh, the result would be that uh, the market will be much less liquid and the cost of price, price risk hedging will be decreased. Uh, the power companies, the TSOs, and the financial regulators in the Nordic countries are really trying to, to fight this, but not so successful so far. Okay, I see uh, I am <laughs> I'm finished. Uh, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, thank you very much, and you can enjoy a uh, picture of the stock market. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much, Lars. Uh, maybe uh, has somebody questions concerning the content of the speech? We will discuss the. There is one question. Right, shop. Yeah. The microphone is coming. Uh, you said. Uh, the example of Nordic countries and the markets coupling with Sweden that is a really good example for it. Uh, as I know, the congestion between the countries on the <coughs> markets, the congestion between the countries and the markets, uh, at the countries at the Nordic markets, are very really low. Do you think that another example can happen with medium congestion or more congestion between the countries? Can you repeat the final part? I think okay. 
Okay, the, the question that I ask is, uh, you said Nordic, Nordic countries is a very good example for market coupling between the countries. But as I know, the congestion between those countries, I'm talking about this transmission lines, is very low, so it's very easy to couple those countries. Do you think that another example with a much more higher congestion or medium congestion can happen at, with, a, with the same, set, set, with the same set, uh, satisfied results? Um, I don't think so really. I, I think, uh, as you said, that there is a uh, lot of transmission capacity between the countries, uh, which means that a very significant part of the time the price is the same in the whole area or close to the same. So uh, producers and many consumers cannot really expect prices to differ very much. There are periods, yes, but, but uh, this is uh, very much France in the market. And that helps a lot, of course. And also, of course, with all the hybrid power so, one shouldn't take the Nordic examples as, as a proof that, that uh, liberalized electricity markets can work perfectly everywhere. It's much more complicated if there are more and more congestions and, and less higher you know, Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we should uh, respect our questions now on understanding the, the content we will discuss later. But I think there is no question. Any question? Yes, there's one. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. <coughs> I question about the capitalist market. So you just describe describe about the capitalist market and energy oil market. But uh, in the case of the United States, like a PGM, so mark, the market center, the capitalist market right now has uh, some problem for the they have a weak motivation to the long-term investment, so they, are, they maybe will face some problem for the getting to the some more investment for the long-term investment. So how do you think about that? Uh, uh, well, uh, the article and Eve that I mentioned uh, when they say that this has worked pretty well, they also pointed out that one of the reasons for that is that it has been quite a lot of overcapacity, and there is a question, of course, about what will happen in the future, will the capacity markets actually induce the investments to the long term. I don't have a very good answer right now, but uh, that's a big question. Okay, I will ask uh, a third question. Hi, just a quick question about the solution to uh, the missing money problem. Have you thought about the solution that Texas Airport implemented, which is called the Operating Reserve Demand Pool, which is like not a market-based solution, but maybe closer to what is required in the demand side? I'm afraid I'm not uh, sufficiently familiar with that, but, but, but as I pointed out, there are many different ways of organizing these markets, and so certainly there is not just one single type. And I think that uh, before really getting into capacity market, I should seriously consider all the alternatives. And I just wanted to mention one aspect of that is getting uh, the consumptions. Because otherwise, it might be very interesting. Okay, I would propose Christoph take the floor. I'm 
consider that uh, the CO2 emission are, could be a problem for the rest of the world. This is my point of view, personal point of view. And uh, if we may uh, really want to, to avoid the irresistible effect of global warming, we must urgently better use fossil energy sources, reduce the systematic strategy of exhausting the terrestrial reserve of our subsoil, and better manage our green assets by favoring decarbonized economies, the use of energy, uh, of renewable sources, investment in projects linked to efficiency, uh, energy efficiency, and for sure, by, by giving a price uh, to the CO2 emission avoiding. Without a uh, global price for CO2, how can we dream of reproducing both energy supply and demand? Consideration of a, of a global radiation for CO2 is required. This will be one of the major issues of the, of the climate conference that, that France will host in Paris during December 2015, which appears to be one of the latest gathering to, to, uh, to influence the internal march of national egos. <laughs> but having said that, certainly I would like to return to a most uh, for frequently forgotten aspect of the energy debates the pivotal roles of uh, energy networks which are not passive structures for conveying gas and electricity flows, but are contributing first and foremost to the change in progress because on the, because on the supply side they enable uh, facility for, for production facility to be optimized, while on the demand side they are connecting citizens which have the potential to become major players in the energy transition. I would like just to remind you of something which is already for, uh, often forgotten, which is if you look at the poor generation cost in, in, in Europe, you have three thirds one is from this generation, one is, one, one is transmission and distribution, and the, uh, the third one is tax. If you remove tax, you have 50% poor generation, 50% TND. And when you have debates, people are always forgetting TND and focusing more, much, a lot on, uh, on, the, on the generation and not enough on TND. And in TND, distribution share is two thirds. So this, we are just forgetting two thirds of the debate. So for that reason, I need to, uh, to brief you, uh, to give you my, uh, my position and, and remind what is the history. In Europe, the network were, 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 were constructed by, in the beginning of the 20th century to support industrialization and, and uh, create links between different European regions. Over time, they have, become, they have been able to adapt, to increase in the city and develop. And uh, just after the Second World War, uh, we, the countries had a dream to interconnect countries between Europe. And today, there are 34 interconnected European states, from Turkey to Morocco, which, are enabling, which, which is enabling us to share electricity, supply and demand, and to avoid a major blackout. The large interconnected network is now a tremendous utility at a time where the resources in Europe are diverging between countries. Germany and Austria, which are building up nuclear power, while other countries like France and Great Britain, which are confirming and interested in it. Except hydro and biomass, the more renewable energy sources are used in a given country, the more the problem of intermittent supply and, and power outage, and, and hence the need to rely on the conventional sources to generate missing, missing, missing energy. In fact, renewable energy sources profoundly set up the system equilibrium because the, the production is cut off and uh, the energy is inject, injected directly into the distribution network, which is something new for us. The network is becoming bidirectional, which is a considerable challenge. Traditionally, the distribution networks were designed to, tra to transport electricity in one, in one direction, from the generation connected to the distribution system to the customer at the end, end point of the network. But with solar panels on residential rooftops and wind turbines integrated in uh, industrial sites, customers are, be are, be are increasingly generating electricity themselves. They are becoming prosumer, they are moving from the end point to the center of the new value to value chain. Indeed, EU's policies have encouraged the development of decentralized uh, electricity generation, of electrical vehicles, of electric energy storage, and of uh, flexible.
equal to one. These changes have given the DSO, distribution, distribution System Operators, the opportunity to rethink the traditional system operation and reflect on how to best develop and operate Europe's distribution network with a view to the future at the same time. So, all of, all of Europe has entered the transition phase, which is in the energy system, uh, something completely new, which will be three challenges having more being more energy efficient, being more intelligent, and also uh, be, be, to be uh, more economical in CO2. This, all these challenges are, 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 are requiring money and financing. This is why we need to move a stable regulatory framework. The European Union has set up uh, targets, we know them, 40% of CO2, CO2 reduction, 25% of nuclear uh, a renewable share and 27% energy efficiency. For France, you know, the, the new uh, energy transition law is going to be implemented, which uh, is uh, proposing uh, strong uh, targets 40% CO2 re uh, emission, or, uh, emission reduction by 2030, which is a big challenge for giving, given our current mix. Uh, we plan also to, de to diminish, uh, to, to lessen the Fossil energy share by 30% in 2030. We want to divide the French energy consumption by two in 2050. This is written in the law. We want to double the, energy, the renewable energy share. We want to, to, to lessen the share of nuclear energy to 50% in 2025. So this is completely rechanging the system. The network will have an essential role uh, to play in this. Further targets for renewable energy requiring us to construct additional new uh, energy transmission systems as well as a uh, distribution system. The second challenge which, which uh, is existing on this energy network is the surge of the digital economy. With, uh, that is revolutionizing the situation with the possibility of using energy network to make increasing, uh, increasingly accurate and detailed information to a greater number of people, making the consumer a prosumer. Of course, energy did not await the recourse to smart grid to become intelligent. There was always a desire to, to connect network better and, and use the best technology as possible. But nowadays, the main innovation lies in increased digitization with the new uh, ability to handle extraordinary quantity of data. In the coming years, the electricity distributors will become the real market facilitator, allowing for, uh, allowing for high quality or, uh, retail process, processes and providing market operators mutual access to measuring data. They are essentially privileged players to guarantee the quality, the measuring accuracy and the performance of the, uh, of the electricity delivery. For that reason, in France, we will install uh, in five years 35 million of so-called linky uh, smart meters. Finally, to finish, the, the intelligence will also be implemented in new form of energy. For instance, a giant step will be, uh, will be taken in, when industrial companies will be able to store energy. This has been suggested this morning. Uh, from another point of view, there have been considerable effort toward uh, energy positive buildings. In the medium term, both workplace will have become so intelligent that they will, they will become fully pledged for generating sites. In conclusion, I would like to pay tribute to the work accomplished in Rapporteur by energy economists in the field of optimizing the energy mix while taking, while taking into account the local imperative of, of the uh, energy policy. Energy economists on the other side have been able to undertake the enormous task, task of controlling energy demand, and they must be successful in the future. But my message today, as a distribution company, is to call upon energy economies to focus on the role of, dis of distribution networks, which I recommend to you is uh, nearly the half of the, of the, of the cost of, the, of electricity. Uh, I will even go as far as why not consider the, the energy system in another way. Rather than starting from the supply side, why not try to specify 
the, to the system from the tomorrow's uh, energy need in the extra con considering the expression of the, of the energy flow. Rather than considering the existing network as a simple adjustment variable between supply and demand, should not they be considered as key resource theoretically to still greatly underestimated with the success of energy transitions? I will be pleased to discuss that with you and uh, during this discussion with this committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to speak here today about renewable energy finance. I've been introduced. I'm, I'm the head of the Frankfurt School of Collaborating Center for Climate and Renewable Energy Finance. Uh, UNEC sets up these collaborating centers whenever they think that they don't have know how in house and they need more experts working on certain topics, in our case, on climate and renewable energy finance. It's a joint venture between UNEP and the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management and we are also supported by the German Federal Ministry for the Environment. We are think and do things, so we provide research reports like those, but we also implement projects in the field. I think that's very important in particular for our role as a political consultant to bring together our policy know-how, but also the reality on the ground. Um, I'm personally, my background is in finance. Before joining the center, I worked 17 years for Deutsche Bank, in particular in renewable energy investment banking. I today want to present our Global Trends in Renewable Energy Investments report covering the investment data for 2014. This is a report which is prepared on a yearly basis in cooperation with Bloomberg um, and the United Nations Environment Program. You might ask why Bloomberg. This is simply because they have all the data. When I was a banker, the first thing after closing a deal was sending the deal sheet to Bloomberg. So we are extremely happy that we can use their data for this report. It's most likely not cover, does not cover 100% of all investments made, but it's the best source of data you will currently find on a global basis. The report analyzes the investment volumes. It does not want to interpret the results too heavily. This is done in a second step, but the report really wants to provide a basis for discussion. I think this is also what we need today. Um, and the first thing I want to show is the global investments since 2004, 2014. You see that 2014 has been a relatively good year. We were also happy that we, we have good news coming to the market this year after two extremely difficult years. 270 billion of dollars have been invested in renewables in 2014 um, after two years of decreasing investment volumes. Um, so now we have to be careful. Decreasing investment volumes, and we only measure US dollar here, can have a positive or negative effect. The first one is the price effect. This has driven also the reductions in 2012, 2013. Solar prices came down significantly. It's a very positive learning curve effect, but on the other hand, we also see reduced uh, investment volumes because of lacking regulatory support and lacking willingness of investors to deploy capital. So we always have to be careful when we talk about decreasing volumes. Is it good or bad? We definitely need more, and that's the reason why we are happy that investment volumes increased in 2014. You see that these bars are separated into different um, categories. This shows the different um, asset classes you will find in renewable energy finance. So we cover the whole value chain of renewable energy finance, um, from R&D, where we talk 
um, venture capital and private equity, in particular in the um, in companies active in manufacturing of components. And then you see um, the green part, and this is actually the deployment of tech technology and the creation of new capacity in the market. You see the small distributed capacity, this is everything below one megawatt, in particular the rooftop solar systems. Um, and then the dark green, that's asset finance, so utility scale, renewable energy power plants. Um, 2014, positive effect is primarily driven by the um, solar boom in China and Japan. I will show you some figures and then later on. Um, $75 billion invested and we also see a strong increase of offshore wind power investments in Europe with $90 billion at least help to increase the overall investment volumes. In total, 95 gigawatts of solar and uh, wind have been installed in 2015. It's significant up from last year where we only had 74 gigawatts installed. Yeah, so again, um, it shows that the uh, technology costs came down, but also more attractive now for investors to invest. Um, quick outlook on 2015. 2015 had a very difficult start with regulatory uncertainty in the US and UK. We nevertheless assume that investment volumes will go up again in the course of this year. Um, this is a chart um, which is really impressive from the perspective of developing countries, although you have to be a bit careful uh, with the definition. Um, it breaks down the global investment volumes, which we have seen on the previous slide, into developing countries and developed countries. So dark green is developed, uh, light green developing countries, and you see this strong positive trend in the developing countries. And, um, last year up by 36% to 131 billion um, developed countries, nearly flat, 3% up. Now we have to be a bit careful and most likely um, this chart won't be included in our next year's report because I think the world is no longer north and south developing and developed. When you analyze the, the volume for the developing countries, you see that China is responsible for 63% of the investment volume. So it's not the least developed countries where the volume is coming from. It's, the, it's China driving this market with 83 billion in 2003. Um, we are very positive about this 25%, you see the slide blue one. Uh, we see a number of countries um, coming to that range of 1 billion plus investments last year. Uh, surprisingly, Indonesia, Chile, maybe not that a surprise, Mexico and Kenya. Um, and then in the range between half a billion and a billion, Jordan, Uruguay, Panama, Philippines and Myanmar. So we see that also in, um, the, in smaller economies, regulatory support can trigger significant investments in renewable energy. Here we get the breakdown um, by region. China leading the highest volume as last year. They have been around uh, two in 2012 and now for two years number one. Um, this year up 40% in particular by a small distributed power in solar. Europe, um, the peak investment volume in Europe was 115 billion back in 2011. Now we are at 58. This is a massive reduction. Uh, Europe is driven by, by these mega transactions. In these 78 billion, there are seven transactions bigger than one billion. These are these big um, offshore wind parks the biggest one amounts for, uh, accounts for uh, nearly 4 billion, it's a 600 megawatt Gemini offshore wind farm in the Netherlands. The US um, is also significantly down. Peak year was again 2011 with 43 billion. Um, it includes this year a couple of yield co IPOs, and maybe we have the opportunity to have a discussion about this yield cost. Yield costs are uh, listed, actually listed shares. Um, and the capital is used to run and to invest in, um, in solar or wind farms. Um, interestingly is that um, $1 out of 3 is in the meantime invested in Asia. This is again a breakdown by country now, from the region to the country. Um, I don't want to go through the individual countries, but what you see is this um, 
the, the difference between the light green and dark green and this split. And you see um, the different strategies of the country approaching renewable energies. Um, China has traditionally uh, focused on utility scale renewable energy power plants, only recently implemented a fit for um, rooftop systems in solar. This is a small likely component. Japan traditionally came from small rooftop systems. The different strategies to integrate um, renewable energies. What is um, a surprise and a positive one is South Africa, and I hope that we will have some time to talk about the aiming environments and what is needed for investors to deploy capital. South Africa had a feeding tariff for many, many years, switched to the auction system only two years ago, and now realizes these, these huge investments. This is certainly not a result of the changing regulatory framework, at least not in my view, but as a result of more than 900 experts now being employed by the government, focusing on this process and ensuring um, that the government and the, regular, uh, the regulator focuses on the needs of the private sector. The split by technology remains nearly unchanged, um, and this for now more than two or three years. Um, wind dominates the split, then solar. Um, I have to mention that our report excludes large hydro, so power plants above 50 megawatts are excluded. If we would include large hydro, they would come in rent free uh, with 15 to 20 gigawatt, approximately 30 billion US dollar invested. On the right hand side you see the growth in the different technologies, again small distributed capacity is only relevant for solar power, below 1 megawatt, uh, nothing, maybe a bit in, in, in hydro, but also only by a few transactions. For, um, for solar, the leading players are Japan with um, 28 billion, in rooftop systems, US with 13, and then China with 8. So a total of approximately 74 uh, billion in small systems. Uh, in the past, Germany has been leading in this analysis. Uh, now, uh, China is number one. But this is now an interesting analysis um, when we uh, talk about renewable energy integration in the overall electricity mix. It compares or it, it analyzes the renewable energy power generation as percentage of the total electricity mix. And if you have a look at the, at the, the blue line, 48% of new generation um, came from renewables in the last year. Yeah. So renewable energy generation is no longer a niche market. It's mainstream. Um, the message is a bit more negative when we talk about the, inst the total installed capacity, not the newly installed capacity, this is the light green one, only 15%. And when we talk about output, we are at 9%. This is because of the lower capacity factors. Yeah. So while I think the momentum is there and, and we are no longer a niche, there is still a very, very long way to go to replace um, the existing uh, ground generation um, assets. This analysis underpins the previous slide. It shows the renewable power investment. Uh, compared to cross fossil fuel power investments, again in dollars, you see that the fossil fuel can be approximately um, 290. Um, the renewable energy is slightly below that, but if we would now exclude the replacement capex for uh, fossil fuel, fossil new investments only came in at 132, so way below the new renewable energy investments. And again, this is for us a very, very positive message. Um, we want to focus in this session on financing and is the private sector ready to finance renewable energy? Um, here, a chart on green bonds. I think this is a very positive development. Um, one new instrument which came to the market to ensure that private sector capital can be deployed, taking into account investor preferences in the private sector, but also ensuring that um, it can satisfy the needs and the financing um, demand. It can bridge uh, investor preferences and finance demand. You see a strongly increasing trend in green bonds um, until 2014. We expect that to um, increase also in future. The green bonds, in contrast to the yield codes I mentioned before, are traded debt instruments. 
uh, yield codes are equity instruments. Both instruments offer one major advantage to institutional investors, and that's liquidity. Both instruments are traded, and um, the, the capital intensity for renewables and the fact that it's normally illiquid is one of the major barriers for institutional investors to employ capital. Those two instruments help to overcome this barrier. Um, for us, as a, a research institution, it will be extremely interesting to have a look how the pricing will develop of such funds. Yeah? In the past, you see that um, the supranational sovereign and agency issues, they dominate, so it's a World Bank, um, the KMWs of the world, um, issuing those funds. Um, we also have seen the first of, of a stronger volume of corporate issues in last year. In the light green part, um, there is, for example, a Toyota one billion issuance to refinance um, electric vehicle leases. It will be now interesting to see whether in future Toyota can achieve lower financing costs for green bonds than for the traditional ones. This is a major focus area of our research. It's not that easy given that the structures are not always similar. Some of the bonds they promised the investors that we use the money in a way that it's green, so we allocate it to green financing needs, but the cash flows, the repayment depends still on the, the corporate credit worthiness. Others are ring fenced, so you can really ensure that the investor in green bonds also benefits only from the green cash flows. This is something um, which has to be uh, which will develop over the next years and certainly there will also better standards be in place. So summarizing um, our 2014's findings, um, it's still not an easy message when it comes to summarizing renewable energy development on a global basis. Um, we, we, we see very, very different trends, um, a, a mix of old and new barriers. The old one is certainly that policy uncertainty <coughs> makes it extremely difficult for investors to deploy capital. Um, overall, private sector investors are pretty easy to steer. If they will return on a green asset and for a ground, then they will deploy the capital on green. Um, but of course, the risk profile is placeable. So we're always talking about this risk return profile. And while the renewables became cost competitive in most cases, um, they still need some regulatory support to ensure um, or to, to ensure stability for the investors and to mitigate. Um, this risk resulting from the um, from the capital intensity of assets. Um, the second, of course, also it's it's easier to integrate renewables if you have five percent renewables in your grid than twenty five percent. So if you have a stronger installed base, it's easier to, to finance or to integrate the first five percent than the second twenty percent. In the past. I'm speaking here for Germany, for example, and we're talking about the field and for rooftop systems have been an easy business, an easy ramp up of investment volumes. It was easy also to integrate it into a grid, but as soon as normal capacity reaches a certain trigger point, we have to change the regulation and the existing electricity market design does no longer allow for a stronger integration of renewables, so more fundamental changes are necessary and the simple feed in tariff won't make it happen. Um, we, we observe um, a number of um, policy measures to reduce, to actively reduce deployment of finance for renewables, in particular caps on renewable energy subsidies, capacity markets, it's a more positive one, but the caps on renewable energy uh, subsidies, but also of caps on installed capacity, makes it more difficult for private sector investors to plan and to find the stability and transparency they need. We observe in some countries quick excess charges because, for example, for rooftop systems in the past, um, they did not have to pay for the use of um, the of the grid as battery or as storage. The same is the case when we talk about net metering regulation in developing countries. This is an externality which is now internalized with quick excess charges. Um, the fourth or fifth one is also. It's a no-brainer, but it's still a very important one. In many developing countries with less mature financial markets, high financing costs make it extremely difficult to finance uh, renewable energy. Um, we, in many developing countries, do not only have an issue with high interest rates, but in particular also with the availability of long-term debt. So 
for many developing countries, they did in sub saharan Africa, so financial markets are very immature, they are paid down the long term debt, that means seven to eight years. It's made it extremely difficult for developers um, to, um, to develop projects through a financially viable business model. Uh, I mentioned auctioning in the context of South Africa. This is, I think, a global trend. We see more and more auctioning global processes replacing feeding tariffs. We have to see how this will impact the financing costs in the medium term. That's it from my side. I'm happy to discuss in more detail. Thank you for a great presentation. My question is about the foreign oil price. Any recent foreign oil price could influence on the investment on the renewable energy. Like, how do you think about that? Yeah, um, the oil price is something uh, which definitely reduces the investor confidence in renewables, but it's only an indirect effect. So, in, in most of the countries, we do not have a direct competition between diesel um, produce or diesel based electricity and renewable energy. We have that in some countries in Africa where we have regional grids between oil and diesel. Um, but overall, it's more indirect effect on investor confidence rather than um, investment oil. Can I ask something more? Okay, so this is about the maybe the foreign oil price will correlate with the, the electricity price. Maybe oil price is going, but it's not possible because there's some other countries like the cost-based electricity market. In case their electricity price is based on the cost of the fuel mostly, so that if the oil price is goes down, maybe it will influence on to the other fossil fuels. Maybe the <coughs> electricity price in the wholesale market will go down. In that case, the pro profitability of the renewable investor will possibly be shrink, I think. So, uh, it, it, it's really only the case for very, very few countries where we have a direct correlation of electricity prices with the oil price. Um, usually it's coal, it's gas, but it's not really the oil price. Um, as I mentioned before, some countries burn diesel for emergency power. Um, there we will have an impact because in Germany we have, for example, the hybridization of regional grids. We recently published a study on this one. Does it make sense if I have a 4 megawatt regional diesel grid to hybridize it with PV? And of course, this analysis gets worse in the current scenario. But for the overall electricity markets, we are not that scared. And there is another aspect have a difference between the fixed market premium and the variable market premium. Variable means if the electricity price goes down, the market premium goes up. And if you have a fixed market premium, uh, the, uh, the, the, the revenue you get from selling electricity from renewables declines if the wholesale market price of electricity declines. So depending on what kind of design the politic has chosen, uh, there is risk. Well, there is no risk. If there is no risk, there is no problem for financing. That is the problem we have. Maybe the, the authors of the three, uh, uh, speakers should come on the podium that we have a common discussion about the issues. And um, I would like to start with this with a small summary, summary of um, what has been said. I now, uh, to make the things a little bit more provocative, he said maybe liberalization has failed. Because uh, what we can see, the electricity prices are cyclical and the investment <coughs> attitude is cyclical, there are periods and there are... But it is typical for, for liberalized markets, we have not a stable And the question is whether the electricity market is such an important market for the infrastructure of the society that the society doesn't accept cyclical behavior. <coughs> this, of course, has also to, to do with, uh, with, um, uh, uh, with financing. The question 